I'm now joined by John Rothstein, college basketball insider for CBS Sports and host of the College Hoops Today podcast. John, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome to be here. I'm excited to have you on, not only because of the great work that you do, but I feel like, in my opinion, you're one of the the few national voices that kind of always keeps an eye on USC hoops. I was just curious, what keeps your attention towards the Trojans program? My wife went there, and she's an alum. <laughs> in all serious, that, that's, that's, that, that's part of it. But, you know, USC, under Andy Enfield, has become one of the most consistent programs in college basketball, not just in the Pac-12 and on the West Coast, and they've been a perennial contender for the NCAA tournament. But I think with the way things are aligning right now, the greatest expectations that USC has had under Andy Enfield will be next season, not just because of what's coming in, but also because of what's returning. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I thought you had a pretty uh, interesting quote. You said one through six in the Pac-12 goes through the Galen Center. What are your expectations for USC next season? Well, the biggest thing I look at when I'm evaluating teams for next season, especially in an era with the transfer portal and immediate eligibility, is what do teams have coming back? So I look at USC and I say, well, they're going to have the Pac-12 preseason player of the year in Boogie Ellis as long as somebody like Azulas Tubelis from Arizona stays in the draft and doesn't return to college in Tucson. They're going to have the pac 12 leading returning shot blocker in Joshua Morgan. And again, if Jalen Clark from UCLA either stays in the NBA draft or isn't able to play because of an Achilles injury, they're going to have the Pac-12's returning leader in steals in Kobe Johnson. And they're also going to have Vince Uwachukwu, who we saw in the last month of the season, was a valuable defensive presence at the front of the rim. So those four guys all have returning experience from a team that went to the NCAA tournament and, again, beat UCLA during the regular season. UCLA, I think, would have been a surefire Final Four team if 40% of its starting lineup was not lost due to injury. So you take all of that returning experience and you really like it. Then you add the number one player in the country in Isaiah Collier at the most important position on the floor. And then you add, obviously, a guy in DJ Rodman, somebody that's been a capable producer at the Pac-12 level. And then I think they added another quality complimentary piece in Bronny James, not just because he's the son of LeBron James, but because it gives USC another really good perimeter player to pair with what I think is going to be one of the most formidable backcourts in the country with Collier and Ellis. See, this is why I said what I said at the top, because when everyone's talking about Bronny James, DJ Rodman, you're the guy talking about, you know, Boogie Ellis and Joshua Morgan's coming back. So your attention to detail really uh, uh, stands out over here. Uh, But as far as who USC is returning and Isaiah Collier, how do you expect Collier and Boogie to kind of mesh in that sense? Well, I think the one positive is this. You never want to be a freshman who's highly touted who has to come in and carry a team. And college basketball in this day and age, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, so much is made, obviously, in terms of freshmen and their potential impact. So so much is made, obviously, about transfers and their potential impact. But here is an interesting anecdote. In the last two Final Fours, 33 of the 40 players who started for those eight respective teams were in their respective programs the season prior. So freshmen can help elevate a program. Transfers can help elevate a program. But we're seeing now to play at the highest levels of college basketball in this day and age, returning personnel is always more valuable than incoming personnel. Interesting. Now, for those who, I guess, you know, USC fans are are football first. I know you tweet USC more than a football school. If if you want to preview what USC is getting with Isaiah Collier, and we can go down to the other other guys, new names on the roster. First, let's start with Collier. Who are, who is USC getting with him? Well, you're getting a player that, if he was going to Duke or Kentucky, would regularly be talked about as the top newcomer in the sport. But he's not going to Duke or Kentucky. He's not going to a Blue Blood basketball program. He's going to USC. So I think it's important to remember that when you think about 
the potential buzz that Isaiah Collier could have when we get into November and December and the holiday tournaments and things like that. I also think when you're looking at Bronny James, you're looking at somebody who, again, could be an ancillary piece to the puzzle with Collier and Boogie Ellis. Shot the ball really well in the McDonald's All-American game. These are all quality pieces, again, that put USC in position, in my opinion, to be the consensus favorite in the Pac-12. But as you know as well as I do, this is only May. (laughs) <laughs> for sure it's not March yet now as far as DJ Rodman what do you think Andy Enfield and co saw from him at Washington State to bring him from uh, Wazoo capable score really good on the glass can obviously defend and now all of a sudden you have a capable forward to spell Kobe Johnson so I think if you're looking at the lineup for USC based on probably experience you could see Collier, Boogie Ellis, Rodman, Johnson, and Morgan. And then, you know, you could say Bronny James could come off the bench or Bronny James could start and Rodman can come off the bench. And you have Vinsu Wachukwu. Aronson Page is also another capable player. But I look at those seven, one through seven, as being a pretty formidable seven for USC to work with. And, you know, Mike Bray, who used to coach at Notre Dame, when I was at a Notre Dame practice, had a great quote. And he said, depth is overrated in games but it's underrated in practice. If you have a really good group of seven or eight guys, you have enough. Now, over the course of a season, are kids going to get sick? Are kids going to roll ankles? Knock on wood, you hope that never happens, but it's part of the game. But if you have a really good seven or eight guys and everybody's healthy, you feel comfortable with what you have. But again, going back to the importance of depth, we saw it with UCLA this past year, I mean, UCLA was playing better than any team in the country. You lose the National Defensive Player of the Year in Jalen Clark to a torn Achilles. You lose the Pac-12 Freshman of the Year, Dem Bona, to a shoulder injury. You need to have your guys at six and seven in your rotation to be able to be quality starters. I think that's the key to having a championship-level team. Now, you mentioned something that's kind of been a, a buzzworthy topic since Bronny uh, committed and signed with USC. Does the son of LeBron James come off the bench? Now, I know Andy Enfield is not one to, you know, acquiesce to the stardom or to any of the fame, if you will. How do you expect him to manage all of the names on his roster? Well, I mean, this is something, again, that Andy Enfield has dealt with with the Mobleys, with Onyeko Okwangwu. He has obviously been down this road before. Now, none of that compares to being the son of LeBron James, especially in Los Angeles. But this is something that's going to be a talking point, I think, early. But Ronnie's going to be a big piece to the puzzle, but he doesn't have to carry the load. I think the people from the periphery need to understand that. But USC added a really, really quality piece to their already dynamic backcourt. And again, I want to make this really clear. I was very high on USC before they got a, they got Bronny James, but now it's just icing on the cake. You mentioned Vince, and we saw him come on late in the season, obviously, because he was going through the recovery process. What do you ex- expect from him in year two? A breakout season, and I think, you know, one of the things that we've always seen with Andy Enfield's teams at USC, you know, we talked about, on Yeko Kwangwu, we talked obviously about the Mobleys, but we also saw with guys like Chemezi Metsu, USC's interior defense under Andy Enfield has always been elite in college basketball. And I think that's going to happen again. If you think now about how you're going to beat USC next season, you're have to you're going to have to be able to go over the top of the defense because you're not going to be able to score in traditional post-up scenarios because of the combination of Morgan and Uachuku. And again, in front of them, you've got a guy again in Kobe Johnson, who if Jalen Clark stays in the NBA draft or doesn't play next season due to injury, will be the leading returning steals guy in the Pac-12. So there is a lot to like about the potential of USC defensively. So what you're saying is USC fans aren't getting excited listening to you preview this upcoming team, then there's something wrong with them, maybe? (laughs) I mean, I I look at it now, and I look at the landscape of the Pac-12, and again, we have to sort out a lot. You know, this is only, again, the second week of May, and I know Arizona's still recruiting. UCLA is definitely still recruiting. They have a number of scholarships. Colorado looks like a quality team. Oregon looks like a quality team. But if you're looking now at the most complete team in the Pac-12, based on returning experience, based on incoming personnel, it's clearly USC. I've said it before. I'll say it again. The Pac-12 goes to the Galen Center. Now, overall, 
10 years down for Andy Enfield at USC. What do you make of what he's been able to do, not only on the court, but on the recruiting trail as well? You know, just a model of consistency. I think in seven of the last eight seasons, USC has won 21 or more games. That's an incredible accomplishment for a school that has only gotten to the Elite Eight twice in program history. One of those times was obviously under Andy Enfield. So just really consistent program, really consistent defensive program, and again, a mainstay at the top of the Pac-12. What do you make of some of the unsung heroes as well uh, with USC basketball, like the Chris Capcos of the world, the Mike Sweats? Like, I feel like there's a lot of uh, great unsung heroes that make Infield's program what it is, and he's the first one to credit them as well. You yeah, know, Andy's always had, you know, a really capable staff. Chris Capco was up for some head coaching jobs this past year. I think it's only a matter of time before he's the head coach. You know, Mike Sweats is one of the rising administrators in division one basketball i've been telling people that you know for years so it's definitely a strong cast of characters who make this program what it is and i think again if you're a usc fan right now there should be more optimism there should be more buzz entering a season for usc basketball than there's been in the preseason under andy enfield there is obviously excitement about evan mobley and isaiah mobley there was obviously excitement when you know there was benny boatwright and tremezi metu but the ceiling to, for me for this USC team is significantly higher than any other team under Andy Enfield because there is a certain completeness to the roster. You know, obviously the Evan Mobley team that lost in the Elite Eight to Gonzaga was just vicious on the interior defensively. But now you are adding the number one player and the number one point guard in the 2023 class in Isaiah Collier to that potential rim protection along with the Pac-12 preseason player of the year in Bogey Ellis. There won't be a game this season where USC is overmatched at the guard spot. Now, I know we've mentioned that it is only May, but if you had to have a, a set a threshold of success of what you expect for this USC team in, in the upcoming season, what is what does success look like for you? I mean, the goal should be to win the Pac-12 regular season title and be a high seed in the NCAA tournament. Anything can happen when you get to the NCAA tournament. We've seen that over the course of history. It is a crazy, crazy three weeks. But the goal for USC should be to win a Pac-12 regular season title and to be in position to earn a quality seed in the NCAA tournament. Again, my rankings are always changing. My Rothstein 45. But USC right now is slotted at number 10. I've said it before. I'll say it again more than a football school. <laughs> now, you mentioned it, but I have to ask everyone who pays attention to USC basketball, what would this program look like or maybe the hype around it or excitement look like if the Evan Mobley season, the, the Mobley brothers together, didn't happen in a COVID season? I mean, you never want to play revisionist history, but I know, again, being married to a USC alum, <laughs> that you know USC, you know, predominantly in terms of its fans and its alumni and its students, gets really, really excited, and for good reason, for football, because USC had a run under Pete Carroll, where USC was always at the top nationally with Matt Leinart and Reggie Bush, but, you know, that season would have been captivating under Evan Mobley, but I think also this season, because of the guard play, has a chance to really capture, you know, the essence of that campus and really be, you know, a something that will be an interesting ticket in the landscape of the greater Los Angeles area. Would you say with Collier coming in, this is the first like true point guard that infield's had since maybe the Jordan McLaughlin years. Yeah. You know, Jordan McLaughlin was obviously tremendous. You know, Julian Jacobs was really good in that dual point guard attack as well. But, you know, I think that, you know, in terms of coming in with cachet, nobody that in the end field has recruited at the point guard spot has come in with the label of being arguably the top player in this class, like Isaiah Collier. So I think it's one thing to bring in a point guard of that caliber. It's another thing to pair him with the potential Pac-12 preseason player of the year in Boogie Ellis. Awesome. All right, John, before I let you go, any thoughts or, or comments you want to tell USC fans about maybe college basketball as a whole or USC hoops in general? If you're a USC fan right now, there is no time like the present. There is a buzz brewing at the Galen Center. And that buzz is palpable. All righty, John. Thank you so much for the time. Enjoy your wisdom as always. Thanks. I appreciate you having me.